Yes, um, uh, one thing before I forget about that, Sean McGamner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, having just read Ian's uh, biography of Tony Cliff, um, the point that Ian makes in there is actually there were no, uh, there were no discussions prior to that fusion at all. Um, as he describes it, um, Tony Cliff met Sean McGamner and had a few words and, uh, and it was a done deal and that was it. And every, everybody found out about it afterwards. You know? <laughs> and uh, I certainly think that, well, whether that would ever have been fruitful is another matter, but it certainly isn't the way to, uh, to, to approach a fusion. Um, I, I strongly agree with the point that Ian has made about the significance of this meeting, that we need to... Um, more thoroughly understand our history and we need to start to work together in a much more collaborative way. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and I think, in a modest way, this meeting is quite significant in that, that we can have this kind of meeting coming from different traditions, maybe kicking chunks out of each other in the past, but we can have a civilised discussion and start to discuss all this. And it's actually rather important. There were not many examples of this that have happened um, in the past, so, uh, so I think that. Um, when I, last week when I sort of realised, started to think about what I was going to say here, um, I thought, well, I phoned Tony up, who phoned, uh, who, my old colleague from Cowley who was here earlier, spoke here earlier, who's had to go now, um, and said, there is a problem with this meeting, what do we say about Jerry Healy? <laughs> and what we say about the SLL because for the last 30 years I've never said a single positive thing about that whole tradition and, and I think there is I'm not sure there's anything positive to say about that tradition however um, when I begin to look at it a bit more and I'll come to this a, a bit later um, I think there are some things that at least indirectly um, um, uh, are, are some are some positive or some things they did some things they did from a very bad political position some things they actually did which were very good things which were, which happened at the time now I the thesis I want to argue in, in in this contribution is that what this period of the 60s the 60s and the 70s and actually up to the mid 80s actually represented was that for the first time for many years, there was a possibility of developing in the trade unions a kind of trade unionism which went beyond the old constraints of economics and organisation, a, a, more, a more politically based trade unionism. And in my opinion, that was developing throughout the 60s, it was developing, certainly developing, well, I would even say the 60s, certainly through the 70s, and then was, was smashed with the miners, with the defeat of the miners, it was brought, it was brought to an end. So I, I think that period was an incredible period of lost opportunity, uh, to, to, to argue, because I, I agree with everything what has been said here about what brought a new left forward in that period, both the new left in terms of, of, of all the ferment and political ferment that's been, dis, been, been described here, new left review and all that, and, and the emergence of Trotskyist, or growth of Trotskyist organisations. I, 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 I agree that there's a multiplicity of factors which brought these forward, and I agree with what's been said. You know, Hungarian Revolution, Khrushchev's speech, hugely important in it. Communist Party lost 10,000 members after, after, after Khrushchev's speech. 10,000 members, disproportionately industrial workers, they were. And the Healy movement took more of them than anybody else and, and, and worked with them for a period, more, more than anybody else, but I'll come back, back, back to that later. And then there's a, what all been mentioned, the Vietnam War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, May, June, France, 68, the Prague Spring, and you could go on to say the fall of Allende in a negative way, the fall of Allende in, 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 uh, in 73, and the Portuguese Revolution uh, in 74. The, these, these were things which were p developing people politically and developing a new left politically, and which would be important. But there was another factor as well, which, in my opinion, underpinned that development, and without which it wouldn't have developed in the same way. And that is, right through the 60s and the 70s, there was a rising, rising level of militancy and industrial struggle. 
and it kind of it underpinned it underpinned the whole thing. It, it was by far the only factor, but it un underpinned the whole thing, and it, it meant that people it, it meant that people um, developed politically very rapidly. I mean, if, I mean, I could take I could take my own situation. I came from conservative background, Tory voter, Tory voting family, worked on a farm, milking cows, went into the army, come out of the army uh, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in 59, and went into the county car plants. Poof, bang, just completely different world. And within three years of going into there, I was, I was a member of the Communist Party and a shop steward and leading strikes on a regular basis. And that was that, that, that kind of let's say everybody joined the Communist Party, but in terms of in terms of a turn to politics, that, that wasn't that wasn't by any means a kind of um, uh, an unusual an, an, an unusual uh, situation. Um, I then left the Communist Party in the, in, in, in sixty five just before getting expelled from it, accused of uh, cohorting with, uh, with with Trotskyists. And then, uh, then had, had this, had, had, we then, there was then a group of us, a group of CP shop stewards in Cowley, six or seven uh, CP shop stewards in Cowley, left the Communist Party, asked Tony Cliff for discussions. We had discussions with Tony Cliff, we had, we had, discussions, we had, we had dis uh, discussions with Jerry Healy, and we chose Jerry Healy. Right, we chose Jerry Healy. Now, there's, there's, but there, there, are, there, are, there are some important lessons. The discussions didn't amount to much in themselves. Because they were, it was all about both discussions were uh, were either state capitalism or deformed worker states. That, that's what it was all about. This was such a dominant thing in terms of who you who you joined that this was what had to be sorted out. And I'm not sure, though, in actual fact, that that was our was way, the way we went, the way we did. Because what impressed us, maybe in a naive way, but nevertheless, what what impressed us was. The, the SLL's uh, um, industrial involvement um, since even before the SLL, through, 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 the, through the, 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 the mid 1950s, and particularly after the, the Communist Party went uh, went into in, it went, went into them, maybe people like uh, um, um, uh, um, Brian Bean and uh, and Harry Constable and people like that went in, um, and we knew we knew that they were heavily industrially involved. Um, they, had, they had people on the docks, they had, they had people in the, in, in the rail workshops in Swindon, um, and, and it, was, it was that connection and what, what appeared to be a very serious attitude uh, towards um, industrial organisation that kind of, a kind of um, a, attracted us uh, um, in, in that way. Um, but militancy, um, it rose... It rose there were some very important strikes, actually, in the 1950s. There were strikes in the car industry, both defending conveners who were getting victimised because of getting organised. Um, there was also a number of big strikes against redundancies because people had come out of the war and they didn't think they were going to start getting redundant, made redundant again, and there was a big reaction against, against redundancies. And there was actually um, a, a, some big strikes on the, on, on, on the building sites, including the building sites in London. Uh, Brian Bean, in fact, uh, I think he was jailed for, 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 for organising on the Festival of Britain strike and, 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 and hold, holding up the date of the completion of the, of the, of the, of the Festival of Britain site. So, so these were serious. And also, what, what, what the SLL had done in terms of the Blue Union in the northern ports, uh, where they, they fought for the independence of the Blue Union against the, the, the TNG, which, of course, was under, under reactionary anti-communist leadership. So, so all, all these things um, had, um, had um, a, an effect on us. And then there was what we were seeing in front of our eyes in our own factory. Um, by, by the mid-60s, the number of strikes in the factory I was working had reached two, an average of 250 a year. And by 69, called the Ministry of, Ministry of Labour figures, there were 624. <laughs> Which was, you know, at least no three, three a day. day. No, it's three. A, it's a night shift. It's, it's, it's one on days, one on nights, and and and, and one, one from some one from somewhere else. And, you know, and it drove it, it, it drove it drove the situation. But it's like Tony was saying this morning. It was also very 
uh, incredibly contradictory. I, I, I became a full-time convener um, uh, of stewards in, in, in 68, where I, I, I was there then for 10 years. One of the first strikes I was called to on one of the, one of the tracks that stopped was a group of workers saying, we're not working with these Pakistanis because they smell of curry. They smell of curry. And we said to them, that's not a problem. Go home now and we'll cover your jobs and don't come back. And, and, and that, was, that, was not, that was not unusual. Like, there were probably quite a, there were quite a few such strikes, right, racist strikes of, of various forms, um, which, which took place actually, now I come to remember it, um, we were able to break the colour bar. The colour bar in Cowley was actually worse than Tony described in Southall. In Cowley, they only in, in, in employed black people on cleansing only. It was cleansing only, which was broken by the unions, and then black workers went onto the tracks, and then there were strikes on the tracks. We don't work, want to work alongside them. And then this, was, this was workers that were continuously taking action and driving at their own working conditions, uh, getting huge victories in terms of imposing work conditions. And also, um, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of the development of political consciousness, which is why I would argue about you know, what was possible, what had been possible in, 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 in that period, was that. Well, there were a number of things. After the Wilson government uh, attempted to impose anti-union laws within place of strife, and then Heath with the Industrial Relations Act, in 69, through 69 to 74, there were 13 national, mostly unofficial strikes against, directly against the government to stop the imposition of uh, anti-union laws, and both of those bills were defeated. Both of them were defeated by major, major uh, uh, unofficial, mostly unofficial industrial action. In the biggest of the strikes against the anti-union law, law, the Industrial Relations Act, in Oxford, a little place like Oxford, there was 27,000 out, 13,000 of which were in the car industry uh, on, on, that, on, on that day. Five minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, and and uh, so, so th there was political strikes, directly political strikes, which were obviously raised, raising consciousness. There were solidarity actions, uh, which were fairly common. Just when we, we will come out for a day in solidarity with that factory over there and need some support, which act, actually, actually is, is, is quite an advanced uh, for, form, of, form of action. There was a series of occupations throughout the engineering industry in the 1970s, which also, again, uh, you know, points towards a development of political consciousness. In the county assembly part I worked in, in the oil crisis, the factory was occupied. I think it's the only, only example of, a, of a, you know, a, a major car assembly plant being occupied. I don't know, I don't know of another one. Um, and then there were the other events, like the Penterville Five. The Penterville Five in, in 72 was a huge consciousness raiser, absolutely huge. The night shift actually in Cowley, I don't, can't remember why it was a night shift. <laughs> but the, but the, the, the night shift walked out spontaneously in solidarity when they heard about the, 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 when they heard about the Pentagon Five. Walked out spontaneously, immediately, asked no one, went home in solidarity with, 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 with that. There was the Shrewsbury pickets and the building workers, which was another <laughs> really big campaign of and, 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 and consciousness. Then, of course, there was a, in the winter of discontent, and I, I mean, you might know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a theory of... Tony Cliff downturn uh, um, theory in the mid 70s, because actually, in my view, the winter of discontent was a bigger mobilisation than even the early 70s, because 72 saw 23 million days of strike action, 79 saw 30 million, 30 million days of strike action, and you had you had a, a seven-week strike of Ford workers, which smashed the pay freeze, and you also had a five-week strike of haulage haulage workers, who were issuing dockets. To, to, uh, to, to move essential services. Employers had to go to a strike committee and say, will you give us a docket and make their case that this is absolutely essential and so on. So it, it, was, it was very hard. And also, I would, I would just finally on this, in my view, what was achieved then in a number of factories, and it wasn't just Cowley, I mean, go to Ford's, Ford's Briggs Body, you know, a, 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 a lot of plants had a, a very similar kind of strike record. Um, in, in that period. And actually, what was achieved then, I wouldn't argue it was workers' control, but there were big elements of workers' control. 
I mean, the shop stewards then, the shop stewards committee of 300 in that factory, controlled just about everything. It controlled who did what job, how hard they worked, um, and, and all, it controlled all the working conditions uh, in the factory. The management had very little say in any of that. The only thing they had a say in, which we never challenged, uh, was what they produced. They decided what they produced, and we decided the conditions under which it was produced. That, that was the way, that was the way. And, and this, so this, this, I think, these achievements um, were, um, were, were, I think, were all of, 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 of low. And also, um, um, okay, so, so, so I, think all, I think all this is, is, is very important to try to preserve all this uh, for, you know, um, when we assess the situation of, 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 of the dire situation we're in now. Because, I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to get struggle off the ground now is because that level of struggle is low. It's not any longer underpinned uh, by that. Actually, if you, look, if you look at the Benite movement that emerged in the, in the early 80s, the driving force of the Benite movement was the, the, the struggle in the factories. I mean, it's one thing that Ben is, does do. I mean, no doubt about that. He responds to struggle. And he's, the, re the reason that Ben moved... Uh, to the left during that period was under the under the impact of the of the struggle in the factory. So I think this is all a, a quite quite an important thing to bear in mind. But if I could just come back to finally to um, uh, to uh, a, a point that Ian made about factions. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't think it's a sort of a matter of whether factions are a good thing or not. I don't think anybody would regard factions as a good thing. It's very nice if you don't have factions. The problem is that the absence of factions equates to an absence of democracy. And that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. It's, it, the, the right of a faction, the right to a tendency, facilitates democracy and, and means that you, there's a, that you don't therefore have to split over everything, but there can, can be an on, ongoing discussion. Uh, in, about that. And also, um, Ian says, well, um, maybe, maybe the thing we shouldn't be doing at the present time um, is, 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 is looking towards fusions and, 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 and regroupments rather than working together. Well, um, I, d I, I think we do have to start working together. We do have to start looking to a different kind of uh, far-left organisation we, than we've had in the past. It has to be much more heterogeneous. It has to be much more tolerant of discussions and, 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 much, more, and, and, and much more open to discussions. It has to, has to have a kind of uh, democratic centralism that doesn't stop people speaking in public and so on. They, people can express their views and everything else. And we, we do need a different kind of far left. Um, but I do think at some stage that is going to uh, mean uh, organisational coming together. Because at the moment, the problem with the divisions we've got at the moment amongst the far left is that they, it's not that it just means the far left is disorganised, it means that the, that, that the wider struggle is disorganised because many of the divisions in the far left replicate themselves in the, in the major campaigns that, that, that are carried out in a wider way. So, so you've got different organisations have their own anti-cuts uh, anti campaigns and so on. So I actually think... That the, the question of unity, particularly in Britain, I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's an issue everywhere, but I do think the issue of unity in Britain is really of particularly importance. And not just because we ought to be in the same room rather than in a dozen different rooms, but because it's in the interests of the working class and in the interests of the struggle for the far left to be united in order to unite the movement as a whole. Thank you.